Well, a bit of a different European outlook today. Thanks for clicking on the Thursday edition, and we are going to talk about winter. As um, promised in recent times, I said that I would produce some uh, a little bit more of a formal uh, discussion with regards to the ideas that I'm now starting to put together. What goes in to a winter forecast, or even in turn a summer forecast? A lot of ours, a lot of hard graft. And a lot of thought goes into these seasonal forecasts. Sometimes we get them right, sometimes we get them wrong. And I would say it was a bit of a 50-50 last year. I got December right, got a good part of January right, actually. And then it completely flipped on its head come February with a strong polar vortex for a period of time before we did eventually see a sudden stratospheric warming that delivered a record breaking cold spell during March. I'm not a big one for analogs. I don't claim to have the ability up here to be able to find the different um, analog packages and whatnot. Gavin at Gavin Gav's Weather Vids it does a terrific job along with Richard Shaw, Shrian Bruin and the team there do a great job at collating all the different analogs based on various parameters, whether it be rainfall during a specific month or a specific season um, versus other aspects as well. Unfortunately, I'm not I'm not up there with regards to Gavin and analogs along with Joe Bastardi and other forecasters out there that provide terrific analog packages and put everything all together. But instead of a mismatch of showing you this, that, and the next thing, I'm trying to show you a little bit more of an organized format with regards to the ideas that uh, are, are in my head with regards to the upcoming winter season. Based on, you know, the current parameters, current drivers that are in play, and then, of course, what we may expect to happen over the next two to three months you can't attribute one aspect to one particular outcome. In other words, a strong El Nino, you know, Indian Ocean dipole, quasi-biennial oscillation, the solar state. It's all, all aspects need to get taken into consideration. You can't just look at one element and just go and say, right, well, it's going to be this or it's going to be that. Unfortunately, it is nowhere near as simple as that. So in today's winter thoughts update one will look at the kind of fundamentals the basics what we look for in terms of building a, a, a winter forecast here and the key factors that um, I've kind of put together here off the cuff a little bit of a quick and dirty look really is the current global state now of course that is the ocean and the land temperature anomaly. We know that we're breaking records. We know that we're in a much warmer state globally, both in the land, the atmosphere, and the oceans are all running, you know, record breaking warm. There's no getting away from that aspect, folks. No matter what side of the climate change fence you sit on, there's no getting away from the fact that we have a warmer world than we did. 5, 10, 15 years ago. Now, of course, you can say, of course, that during the previous Super El Nino back in the mid-2010s, we did have a warmer planet than we do have now. So I have to take that into consideration as well. But the world is a warmer place than it was a decade ago. That has to get taken into consideration as well. Uh, this is not going to be a forecast, by the way. This is just showing you the elements, the drivers, the, you know, what, goes into making a forecast. This is not a call on the winter 2023-24. This is just showing you the various aspects, the elements that need to get taken into consideration here. But you know, even though we've got a warmer planet, the oceans are running record breaking warm. The Atlantic is super warm at this moment in time. Let's have a look uh, quickly at the uh, global sea surface temperature anomalies here. Look at how warm it is across the majority of the planet here. So that has to get uh, taken into consideration here. Off the cuff, if I'm being completely honest with you, I would say right away that we're likely to see a warmer than average winter. But again, it's not as simple as that. I don't think that we're going to get away from the fact that we could have some very significant cold spells this upcoming winter. And we'll look at that in just a second here. 
But generally speaking, like we've seen with summer 2023, I do think that we will see, based on the, the overall warmth, you know, whether it be atmosphere, ocean or land, I think the 90-day December through February period will average out warmer than average, probably anyway. And that has been the trend in recent years as well. Again, if only it was as simple as that here. So looking at the current overall global sea surface temperature anomaly, as well as the state of, of, of everything. The past summer upper atmospheric pattern. Now we did see a very blocky type summer, probably the most negative NAO summer since 2009. Is there any kind of, uh, you know, uh, what's the right word? Is there any kind of relationship to possibly the year 2009? And of course, what followed that? I, I'm not sure. Um, Enzo, the Southern Oscillation Index here, the, that has to get, of course, that is going to be a big factor. That's probably a big factor in driving a lot of aspects globally at the moment here. The type of El Nino that we see, is it an east or is it central based El Nino? That has a massive impact on the atmosphere, not just for Northwest Europe, but around the world here. quasi binial Oscillation is easterly. So what is that? That is the belt of winds within the stratosphere over the equator when it's westerly it tends to favor not always but it tends to favor uh, an enhanced polar jet stream of course the polar jet stream is the jet stream that it dictates our weather during particularly the winter season it tends to be strong it tends to drive systems in off the atlantic bringing mild wet windy conditions frequently during a typical uk summer when those winds, the quasi binial oscillation, those winds within the stratosphere over the equator, not over our latitude, but over the equator, is blowing strong out of the opposite direction. So in other words, instead of it being west to east, it's actually east to west. So they're reversed. That sometimes has frictional effects on the polar jet stream. It slows down the polar jet stream uh, circumnavigating around the northern hemisphere in the middle altitude pattern that then in turn can weaken the polar vortex and of course that is that body of a uh, reservoir of cold air that's spinning like a, a, a you know o over the top of the pole the stronger that polar vortex the stronger the winds are within the mean zone of winds over the stratosphere within the troposphere that tends to lead to a stronger Polar, uh, polar jet stream, sorry. But when you've got the East QBO, the quasi binial oscillation, blowing from east to west, that has frictional effects on polar jet stream. It also can have weakening effects on the stratospheric polar vortex. So that's another thing that needs to be taken into consideration. The Indian Ocean dipole is positive, and we'll look at that in just a second. And the Atlantic hurricane activity. Sometimes late in the season, tropical uh, cyclones, and we've got, of course, an active tropics at the moment within the Atlantic. Sometimes when you transfer heat from the equatorial region northwards, that sometimes can lead to warming within the mid and high latitudes. And of course, when you're driving warmer into the high latitude pattern, sometimes that can lead to high latitude blocking, which then in turn releases cold out of the Arctic into the middle altitude pattern. So the tropical Atlantic is an important factor to take into consideration. So things we know currently, we continue to witness record warm global land and ocean temperatures. The world is a warmer place than it was 10, 15, 20 years ago. The El Nino will be present during this winter. That is a fact. The QBO will be easterly this winter. The Indian Ocean Dipole is positive now, but expected to go neutral during the winter season here. What's important about the Indian Ocean Dipole? Again, looking at the global sea surface temperatures, we've got cooler waters near Indonesia and Australia, warmer waters the further west you go towards Africa here. That in turn has upward motion over the West uh, Indian Ocean, downward motion, sinking air, drought conditions, warmer than average temperatures, particularly during the springtime and in, in the early summer for Australia, Indonesia. And that, of course, has influences 
um, across the world here when you've got that positive Indian Ocean dipole. Looking at the solar situation here, so uh, another thing, so El Nino will be present during the 2023-24 winter. Solar cycle 25, has it already reached this peak in terms of the maximum or is it the first of a double peak? Strong, stronger than cycle 24, but weaker than the previous seven cycles. How much does uh, how much do, of a role does this have? I don't know. I'm not in hundred percent sure about the, the, the solar cycle situation of course we had the minimum back in 2019 and i did have a forecast for a colder winter but the, this is where we're gonna this is where things get complicated because we had the solar minimum back in 2008 then we had the 0910 winter we had of course the front run in 2009 uh, 10 11 winter coldest in over 100 years for the uk but then the rest of the winter was generally mild but we had a spell from late 2008 to 2011, even 12, 13 to an extent, where we had a run of colder winters. And now I always attributed that to the solar minimum of 2008 into 2009. But of course, 2019, with a, a, an Indian Ocean dipole that was record breaking strong, now there is some scientific argument to suggest. That the record strong IOD, the positive Indian Ocean dipole, led to a supercharged polar vortex over the high latitudes and drove a very mild winter across much of the northern hemisphere. But that was during a solar minimum or just after a solar minimum. So things are very, very complex. East QBO, so you can see here that the transition from away at 10 HP, which is the very top of the stratosphere, right the way down to the boundary layer around kind of 40 to 50 HP, you can see the winds going from westerly uh, to uh, easterly. And that, of course, I've already explained slightly. This correlation here um, can lead to high latitude blocking. So this is based on an East QBO. December through February period. This is of severe weather. Europe, by the way, very interesting stuff. Notice the, the, the positives. Canada, Greenland, north of the UK, negative over Europe here, indicating a colder overall situation. The polar vortex is alive and kicking. It's back. This is the current state. This is uh, what it's expected to be at the end of September. So it's strengthening quite considerably. And according to the ECMWF, it's expected to go generally average in terms of the mean zone of wind over the over the Arctic region through the remainder of September and into the month of October. So it looks as if it's going to remain fairly average in terms of the strength. El Nino, this is the current situation, as you can see here. Uh, this is the regions, region 1.2, region 3 is further out, and then at the Central Pacific, we've got the 3.4 region. This is the current uh, situation, uh, sea surface temperatures, uh, region 1.2, which is up against the South American coast. You notice here that it's held steady and then dropped slightly, so it slightly cooled the, the Far East Pacific. This is region 3.4, which is the Central Pacific. We're rising, we're warming things up. The El Nino is expected, according to the CFSV, to drop off a cliff, so we're going to start to see a cooling against the South American coast. Region 3.4, it looks as if it's going to cool steadily as well. And notice here the core of the warmth is actually off the South American coast towards Region 3 and 3.4. Uh, the MJO uh, warm phases tends to be 3, 4, 5, and even in 6. Looks as if the CFSV2 indicates that we've got um, enhanced upward motion within the atmosphere over the Central Pacific, which a large scale sinking over Indonesia and to the north of Australia. We've got upward motion over the west portion of the, of the Indian Ocean, which of course correlates well with the positive IOD. Notice in December and January, we shift that important upward motion into the central portion of the Pacific. And it looks as if it's seeing the warmth spread out of South America and towards the central portion of the Pacific. If you have a strong um, El Nino, folks, we're not going to have a particularly cool winter. If we have it over the central portion of the Pacific, 
I'm pretty much run out of time, but I will do another video, so stay tuned for that coming up.